got your Bibles. If you want to turn to the book of Luke, we're going to start in chapter 2. Well, Christmas is over. I don't know about you, but you know, I really love Christmas. I love the thought of Christmas. Uh, Rachel and I were talking this morning that we like Christmas music, but Christmas music is difficult to sing. But I love to hear it. I, I, I love the time we spend with family. I love the, uh, the food and the, and the lights. I, I really find a lot of joy in celebrating Christmas. But I'll be honest with you, I'm glad it's over. <laughs> but at the same time, I miss that feeling of Christmas. It's like everything is building up to that one day. I, I know, we'll argue that, you know, maybe, maybe right after Halloween may not be the best time to actually start building up to Christmas, even though that's what happens today. But sometimes it's, it's just a lot of work. And it's a lot of stress. And you build up to it, and then boom, it's over. Sometimes I'm happy to be done with it, with the hustle and the bustle of the holiday season. It's like at the end of Christmas, I'm like, <sighs> I felt that after a Christmas Eve service. I'm like, Whew, it's done. <laughs> but what now? What do we do now? Well, the, the truth is just because Christmas is over, the story of Christmas doesn't stop. The prophecy from Christmas is not over. We still have things that are occurring after Christmas in our Christmas story. Jesus, the birth of Jesus continues. So I want to end this Christmas series by examining what happens after that silent night. What happens after the shepherds have left? And it's the next day and the next week. And the first event I would call it the Christmas event that we encounter in Scripture is actually in Luke 2, beginning with verse 22. And it says, And when the time came for their purification, according to the law of Moses, they brought him up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every male who first opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord. And to offer a sacrifice according to what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. You know, I, you know, we kind of forget sometimes that, you know, Mary and Joseph were Jewish. So there are laws, there are things that must be done um, in this process of birth. In Leviticus 12, it, it tells us that once a child is born, that the mother would be ceremonially unclean for seven days. So for seven days, Mary would have been unclean. She could not do certain things. She definitely could not go to the temple. But there's other things she would not have done. She would, have taken, would not have taken in visitors. She would, she would have been closed up by herself and with the child. She was ceremonially unclean. And if the child, if it was a boy, would be circumcised on the eighth day. So on the eighth day, Jesus would have been circumcised. Then the mother had to wait an additional 33 days for her purification to be done. For that time, from day one to day seven, she was, she, was, uh, she was ceremonially unclean. And then she had to wait 33 days until she, was, until she could go to the temple to become ceremonially clean. And her time of purification would be over. And she had to offer a sacrifice. She would present herself to the temple, offer the sacrifice, and since Jesus was the firstborn, he would be taken to the temple, and he would be dedicated to the Lord. So Mary and Joseph would probably have stayed in Bethlehem, because she wouldn't have been able to travel for those, those times. So they're still in Bethlehem. Remember, uh, Joseph has family in Bethlehem, I'm assuming. It's the, the birthplace of his, his families from there, and all of his family's coming back there. So I'm sure there are plenty of places for him to stay. We know there are, because when we get to the wise men, we'll see that they see him in a house. So we know that they're staying in Bethlehem. 
And then Jesus, they take him Jesus to the temple for Mary's purification and for Jesus to present it, be presented to the priest. So Mary had to wait 40 days after the birth of Jesus, and then she could dedicate him to the Lord. Well, what I find interesting about that is, how many days was Jesus in the desert being tempted? 40. How many days did it rain at the time of Noah? 40. Hmm. Don't ever let these things pass you by. Think about them. Think about them. Think about the fact that as Jesus is waiting, as, a, as an infant, he is waiting for 40 days to be dedicated to God, to begin his life dedicated to God. Just as he waited 40 days in the desert, waiting to begin his ministry. God is, there's purpose for all these things that are happening. Jesus himself had to wait for 40 days when he was born. And then as they're entering the temple courts, we see another prophecy that gets fulfilled. In verse 25, it says, Now there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and this man was righteous and devout waiting for the consolation, which means the redemption, the salvation, the, 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 for Israel to again be freed of their bonds of Israel. And the Holy Spirit was upon him. This is another place you've got to think about. This. It was upon him. It was not in him. Very seldom in the Old Testament and into the New does the Holy Spirit enter anybody. It's not until Pentecost that we see the Holy Spirit entering people and abiding in us, living in us. In the Old Testament, usually he, the Holy Spirit was upon them, was around them. And to this day, at this point in time, Simeon does not have the Holy Spirit in him. He has the Holy Spirit upon him. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ, before he had seen the Messiah. And he came in the Spirit into the temple and when the parents brought in the child, Jesus, to do for him according to the custom of the law, he took him in his arms and blessed God. And we'll get to a moment what he said. Isn't it interesting? I don't know about you, but there have been times in my life, and even recently, where I will meet someone, and I'll find out that we have a connection that goes back a long way. They know somebody who knows someone that knows me, or they know someone who knew me a long time ago. And it's interesting because I believe that God weaves us in and out of people's lives. That he knows what we're going to need at that time, and he brings people into our lives who have already have a connection with us. And that brings us comfort. We always say it's a small world, right? It really isn't. It's a rather large world with a whole lot of people in it. But God is such an awesome God that he directs people into other people's paths. And here we have a perfect example of God directing Simeon on that day to be in that spot. Because if you know anything about the temple, the temple complex was a large complex. There were many entrances, many gates that people could enter through. And you'd enter into this big uh, court of the Gentiles. You could have gone anywhere. And what do they do? They run into each other. And Simeon knows this is the Messiah. He's anticipating the coming of the Messiah so that the grief of Israel would be removed. He, he wasn't told when it was going to happen. He just was told it was going to happen. He was told that you, were going to, that you were going to see the Messiah before you die. God did not reveal everything to him. I wish he would at times, but he doesn't. He doesn't reveal everything to us. He gives us what we need to know. So and here, 40 days after the shepherds visited the manger, the prophecy revealed to Simeon came true. He held the Messiah in his arms. And what does he do? He blesses God. And then he gives them a prophecy about this child. This is what he says in verse 29. He's, he's talking to God. He says, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation. That you have prepared in the presence of all peoples. Again, it's that reference to this is not just the Messiah of the Jews. He is the Messiah for all people. 
Jews, Gentiles. It doesn't matter. A light for revelation to the Gentiles, as he says, and for the glory of your people Israel. And his father and his mother marveled at what was said about him. Again, these are things that Mary is going to store up in her mind and think deeply about. And Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, Behold, this child is appointed for the fall and rising of many in Israel. He is prophesying now. And for a sign that is opposed. And he goes to Mary and he says, And a sword will pierce through your own soul also. So that thoughts from many hearts may be revealed. This child that Simeon is holding is more than just the Messiah for Jews. It's just the Messiah for all, for the world. Many in Israel were looking for a conquering Messiah. One who would be political, would come in, would overthrow the Romans, and finally restore a Jewish leadership over the whole nation. Bring freedom. But see, the consolation that Jesus was going to bring was so much greater than anything political or national freedom. Those things were not going to provide what Jesus, the true Messiah, was coming to provide. The baby in Simeon's arms would bring spiritual freedom and forgiveness of sins. See, for some, Jesus would be a a, a Messiah to life. His death on the cross would bring life. But for others, his death on the cross will bring death. Death to those who do not believe and refuse to believe. This child would be opposed, as Simeon says. And this is going to deeply grieve Mary. Her heart is going to be pierced. It's going to have like a sword through her heart because of what happens to Jesus, her son. But Simeon was not the only one who was waiting in the temple to see the Messiah in the temple courts. We go on to verse 36. It says, and there was a prophetess. This is Anna, the prophetess, the daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asher. She was advanced in years, having lived with her husband seven years from when she was a virgin. She had only been married for seven years, and then as a widow until she was 84. Now, if you understand a couple things here, first of all, usually the tradition was that if you were when a woman would get married, she was usually married very young. She was probably married 13, 14. So Anna would have been 20 or 21 when her husband died. So from the time she was 21 until she was 84, she lived, she did not remarry and she remained a vir- uh, not a virgin, she remained celibate. That whole time, never married again. But what did she do for those all those years? She did not depart from the temple, worshiping and fasting in prayer night and day. And coming up to the ver- that very hour, she began to give thanks to God and to speak of him to all who were waiting for the redemption of Israel. See, Anna is one of the few women in the Bible who are actually called a prophetess. So right after Mary and Joseph encounter Simeon, Anna sees the baby, recognizes that this is the promised Messiah, and she begins to praise God. And not only does she just praise God, but then she begins to share with everyone around her what has happened. See, see the good news of the Messiah is not to be just kept to ourselves. She could have just kept it to herself. She was blessed to have been, been able to see the Messiah, and she could have praised God, and she could have gone home. But what does she do? She starts telling everybody in the temple courts what she sees and what she knows. The good news is not to be kept to ourselves. It's to be shared. The Redeemer has come, and the prophecies are being fulfilled right before their eyes. And Anna feels blessed to see it happen. And 
And so Joseph and Mary, I'm sure, do what they need to do in the temple, make their sacrifice. Mary is finally ceremonially clean, and they probably go back to Bethlehem. And we kind of get our next um, after Christmas night encounter in the book of Matthew. Matthew 2, verses 1 to 2. Here's what Matthew says. He says, Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the Great, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who was born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. Now this may have been days or months or could have even been a couple years after Jesus was born. We know that it was probably at least 40 days because Mary would not have been able to see anybody. She would have been, she had to go through the 40 days or the 33 days of, of, of preparation for cleansing on the 40th day. We know these wise men come from the east. It is probable that they were from Persia, which is modern day Iran. More than likely, they were familiar with the writings of Daniel. Because see what Daniel says in Daniel 9, verses 24 through 25. It says, 70 weeks are decreed about your people and your holy city to finish the transgression, to put an end to sin and to atone for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness and to seal up both vision and prophet and to anoint the most holy place. Know therefore and understand that from the going out of the word to restore and build the temple or Jerusalem to the coming of the anointed one, a prince, there shall be seven weeks. Then for 62 weeks it shall be built again with squares and moat, but in a troubled time. See, they knew. They knew that the promised Messiah, the promised king of the Jews was coming. These, these, these men, these wise men, were from, like I say, were from Persia, from Iran. They would have, this is where Daniel would have been taken when, when Jerusalem was attacked by the Babylonians and was taken back. Daniel was one of them that was taken back. He was young, and he was, and he was in the king's service. And Daniel became very wealthy. And he interpreted dreams for the king. And I'm sure he wrote many things. And they would have been familiar with this. They very, very well may also have been familiar with the prophecy of Balaam. If you know who Balaam is, Balaam was the man who had the talking donkey. Yes, if you don't know that, there's a talking donkey in Scripture. A donkey who saves his life. But Balaam wasn't exactly a good person. I'll just say that. We can read more about him in the Old Testament. But in Numbers 24, 17, this is a prophecy that Balaam gave. It says, I see him. I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. And this is the part to, to remember. A star shall come out of Jacob. And a scepter shall rise out of Israel. It shall crush the forehead of Moab and break down all the sons of Sheth. See, Balaam's prophecy specifically mentions a star. And that's the star they're following. They came to Jerusalem to find the king who was to be born under the star that they've been following. I mean, it makes sense, wouldn't it? So somebody is a king. Oh, obviously, if he's a king, if a child is born a king, who's his father? A king. And where would the king live but in Jerusalem, the capital of Judah, the capital of Israel? So they come, and they ask, where is this king? Where is the king of the Jews? But they don't exactly encounter the king that they're expecting. In verses 3 of Matthew 2, 3 through 6, says, When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled in all Jerusalem with him. You think about that. Herod finds out that there's another king born. Well, he's, he's, he has sons. Though he'll kill most of them, he has one that he wants to put in his place to be king. So this troubles him. There's another king. And not only that, all of Jerusalem is troubled. Why? Well, they're under Roman rule, even at this time. And 
Romans don't like other kings. They like the kings that they put in place. So the people are concerned. They're troubled. So what does he do? He assembles all the chief priests and scribes of the people, and he inquires of them where the Christ was to be born. And they told him, in Bethlehem of Judea, for so it is written by the prophet, and you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, by, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for you shall come from, from, from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. The scribes knew where the Messiah was going to be born, but they never told the king. Could you imagine that? Could you imagine you're a scribe and you go into the king and you know Herod, Herod's called Herod the Great, not because he was a great man, but because he built a lot of things. But he was a very ruthless man, killed a lot of people. And you go and you say, well, you know, king, and the prophet said that there would be another king that was born in Bethlehem. You would probably be dead. He'd probably kill you for, for, for revealing the truth to him. So the wise men encounter Herod, who knows nothing of this new king being born. And he's worried because his kingdom now is in jeopardy. Calls the priest, calls the scribes. They tell him from the prophet Micah what's going to happen, who, where the king is going to be born. And in his normal method, Herod begins to plot. Hmm, what shall I do? He's very, he's very much known for his plotting. And in, if you read the history, especially of Josephus, you'll see that he is a plotter. So here's what he does in verse 10. He says, Then Herod summoned the wise men secretly to ascertain from them what time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go, search diligently for the child. And when you have found him, bring me word that I too may come and worship him. I'm sure he didn't say it that way. I'm sure he did it in a way that made them really believe that he wanted to worship them, worship the, the new king. After listening to the king, they went on their way. And behold, the star that they had seen when it rose went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. And when they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. So what do they do? They leave Jerusalem. They head the 20 or so miles south because they see the star over Bethlehem. And here's the what they encounter. Verse 11, it says, And going into the house, they saw the child with Mary his mother, and they fell down and worshipped him. Then opening their treasures, they offered him gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country by another way. So Mary and Joseph are back from the, the temple time. We, again, we don't know how many days. It could have been a few days after that. It doesn't matter. What matters is we have three wise men, three magi, magicians. Not, you know, not sleight of hand magicians. They were considered court magicians. They would prophesy. They would interpret dreams. So what David did, or Daniel did. In fact, it is very much possible that the, the things they brought, the gold, the frankincense, the myrrh, the gold obviously would have come from it, but the other things probably were purchased along the way from the money that, that Daniel had stored up. I'm sure that Daniel may very well have provided for the Messiah. And there's a reason they're given these gifts. And we'll see that in a few moments. But they're warned to return, not to return to Herod, but to return in another direction, another way to go home. Remember that part about Simeon's prophecy where it says thoughts from many hearts will be revealed? Because of this baby, we're going to see a heart revealed in just a moment here. The heart of the king, of King Herod. It says in verse 16, it says, Then Herod, when he saw that he had been tricked by the wise men, became furious. 
And he sent and killed all the male children in Bethlehem and, all, and in all that region who were two years old and, or under, according to the time that he had ascertained from the wise men. So Jesus would have been at least anywhere from, a, from 40 days old to two years old. Then was fulfilled what was spoken by the prophet Jeremiah. So again, we have prophecy being fulfilled. A voice was heard in Ramah, weeping and loud lamentation. Rachel, weeping for her children. She refused to be comforted because they are no more. Herod killed all the newborn boys. Interesting. What did Pharaoh do? To the Israelites, killed all the newborn children, boys. Herod cannot have anybody threatening his rule. Pharaoh could not have anybody threatening his rule. So he has all the boy children under the age of two slaughtered in Bethlehem. And this was prophesied by the prophet Jeremiah. Because Rachel was Jacob's wife, Joseph's. Joseph's mother, the line of David. This is Bethlehem, the town that Jacob founded for Rachel, where Rachel is buried. Fulfilled prophecy again. But you know, God always has the last word. Understand that God will always have the last word. Joseph is warned in a dream to leave and to go to Egypt before Herod can carry out his dastardly deed. In Matthew 2, 14, it says, And he rose and took the child and his mother by night and departed to Egypt. I think that gold, that frankincense, and that myrrh is going to come in handy as they go to Egypt. And he remained there until the death of Herod. And this was, this was to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Out of Egypt I called my son. You know, many people will look at that prophecy and will think, well, that's just God talking about the fact that he called the Israelites out of Egypt. Yes, he did. But this is specifically talking about, I called my son. He called Jesus out of Egypt. A Christmas prophecy again fulfilled. Herod's dead. And Joseph was planning on going back. I'm sorry, not yet. <laughs> Joseph was, was planning, probably, probably staying in, in Bethlehem, going to actually make a living in Bethlehem, possibly. We've, we'll see that in a moment. Why? But he's instructed in a dream to return to Israel. But the problem was he was planning on, planning on going to, to Bethlehem. But he finds out that he probably should not go to Bethlehem. Because what he finds out, you see this in verse 22, but when he heard that Archelaus was reigning over Judah, this would have been Herod's son, in place of his father, Herod, he was afraid to go there, and being warned in a dream, he withdrew to the district of Galilee, and he went and lived in a city called Nazareth, so that what was spoken by the prophets might be fulfilled, that he would be called a Nazarene. Again, God orchestrating the fulfilling of prophecies. Another prophecy fulfilled, but not quite as apparent of all as all the others because you know normally people who were from Nazareth were not called Nazarene there was the the Nazarite um, um, vow that you would take where you would you would cut your hair you would make a vow and you would you would cut your hair and not grow it back until a certain time it was it was all part of a process so it's, it's thought that maybe uh, Matthew was kind of paraphrasing a couple words of the prophet from several prophecies that use similar sounding words as the word netzer, which means a sprout or a shoot and correlates it to Nazareth, which was Jesus' boyhood home and actually Mary's hometown. So if we go to Isaiah 11, it says, there, was, there shall come forth a shoot from the stump, a shoot, a shoot is the netzer from the stump of Jesse, and a branch from his root shall bear fruit. It is also possible that since Nazareth was a, a Gentile territory, it provides fulfillment of a, the Messiah's mission to not only to be to the Jews, but also to the Gentiles, to all nations. 
And then the third possibility is a reference to the fact that the Messiah would be despised and rejected. We see that in Isaiah 53.3. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and was esteemed him not. You know, Nazareth was 55 miles north of, um, of Jerusalem, 55 to 60 miles had a very negative reputation among the Jews. This was the first place that when Rome came in to conquer, it was the first place they went through, and they conquered it like that. It was nothing to conquering. It was the place of Gentiles. What's interesting is if you go to the, uh, the story of Christ and his life, and even his, uh, one of his disciples, uh, Nathaniel, which is thought to be Bartholomew, one of his own disciples, when he was told that Jesus, to come and see Jesus in Nazareth, this is what he says. He says, Nathanael said to him, can anything good come out of Nazareth? And Philip said to him, come and see. See, an amazing amount of prophecy is getting fulfilled this first Christmas. But there's even more prophecy to be fulfilled in Scripture. So the question that we ask ourselves at the end of this Christmas season is, is, is what are we going to do? What are we going to do with all this fulfilled prophecy from Christmas? And what are we going to do with the prophecy going forward that's being fulfilled before our very eyes? Well, you know, Simeon and Anna, the wise men, see, they all believed God's word. They believed it. They sought Jesus. They recognized his worth. They humbled themselves. And they worshiped Jesus. They obeyed God instead of obeying man. That's what we need to do. That's what we need to do with the prophecy from Christmas. And we need to do with the prophecy going forward. We need to believe God's word. We need to seek Jesus. And we need to humble ourselves and worship him. Let's pray. Thank you for joining Living Faith on our YouTube channel. My prayer is that this message today has encouraged you and strengthened your faith in Jesus Christ. We would love to connect with you, so please subscribe to our channel and hit the bell so that you get updated when we add a new message. Also, please leave any comments you might have in the comment section. We would love you to join us live for our service on Sunday mornings at 10 o'clock. We hope you have a great day today. God bless.